All right, how's it going, everybody? It's Jay Steven here. So this is going to be um, a little live stream. I hope everybody has been enjoying the Richard the Lionheart video that I just uploaded. I'm kind of proud of that one. All right, so the whole reason I decided to do this stream is because I'm going to jump over here to the chat. Uh, Jin Sul, what's up, buddy? Regiment, how's it going? Regilio Diaz, Matthew Rivera, how's it going, guys? I'll jump back to the chat in a little bit here. So, all right. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? All right. So, um, I got an interesting question from one of my Patreon people. Uh, and it's a question that kind of made me think, you know, uh, I haven't really done many videos where I've gone over some of the basic mechanics of medieval warfare. Uh, Rand and I did some of that in some of our early podcasts together. But um, anyway, let me go ahead and read this question I got here. Uh, hello, RCH. This may seem like a stupid question, and there's probably an obvious answer, but I can't understand how cavalry could ever defeat infantry. How could men on horses ever go against men on foot armed with big shields and spears. If the horsemen tried to approach, couldn't the infantry just stab the horses? What am I missing? Thank you, Ravi. I believe that's how you pronounce that name, Ravi. If I got that wrong, buddy, I, I apologize. But okay. All right, so fair enough. So first of all, Ravi, um, I don't think there's such a thing as a stupid question. Um, I think, uh, now I do think your question kind of does uh, get to some basic points about medieval warfare. And probably a lot of you guys in the chat right now could, could answer this question very well, uh, just, just as well as I'm about to. But um, let's go ahead and take a look at it. So, all right. So again, I do think this is kind of an interesting, uh, you're getting at so, some of the interesting dynamics in uh, how a group of, uh, mounted warriors could face off against a group of uh, men on foot who are armed with, uh, you know, like you said, uh, the typical infantry weapons in the medieval era and in most eras, um, a shield and a spear of some kind. Of course, the other thing is you also want to have uh, infantry who are armed with some sort of projectile, you know, bow and arrow most likely, especially in this period we're talking about. Uh, I do think you get at some of the the issues that cavalry face. Uh, and I think, yeah, this is kind of one of those things that the general public, I think, probably isn't real uh, savvy on. Now, if we think about like movies, what do movies always show uh, when when there's a medieval battle? It usually starts off with a group of guys, you know, infantry guys fighting each other, you know, guys with spears and shields or something like that, guys on foot. And then all of a sudden the cavalry comes in, right? Some guys on horses come charging right into the middle of that. And then they stop and they start swinging their swords down at the guys on foot down below them, right? Okay, this is wrong. This is not how it worked. And it brings up, Ravi, I think, some of the issues that you brought up, right? Like the way that a mounted warrior is most vulnerable is of course the fact that he is limited by, by the fact that he's up on this big horse. Um, you know, he's less wieldy in most circumstances, not all, but in most, uh, you know, guys on foot can, um, can move around quicker. They, they, they're not encumbered by this big animal underneath them. And so, yeah, about the dumbest thing, that a guy, a cavalryman could do is ride into infantry and stop and then try to fight them like that, right? And that's not how cavalry functioned in medieval warfare. So, and again, like you're talking about, you're talking about the how formidable an infantry can be. And if you've got, yeah, if you've got a group of guys who are well organized and they are in a good formation, you know, let's say a shield wall type formation or something like that. And you've got, and you know, they've got their shields, they got their spears. Uh, that's a tough target for your typical cavalry to go up against. So 
<clears throat> excuse me. So yeah. Um, so how did how did this normally work? Well, in medieval warfare, normally what would happen in most circumstances, now I'm talking about your typical cavalry. We're going to talk a little bit more about Frankish hev heavy cavalry because they could function a little bit differently. But in your typical situation, um, cavalry would kind of come in for the kill more often. Like armies basically, medieval armies had infantry and cavalry. And they had a lot more infantry than they did cavalry. So the infantry can protect the cavalry during the initial phases of the engagement. When two armies are coming toward each other, the first thing that usually happens is both sides are going to be firing arrows at each other. So you keep your distance at first, right? I mean, you know, you don't know what to, to expect yet. Um, and at this point, nobody's committed, right? So a lot of times in medieval warfare, uh, two armies that are well-ordered could approach each other, maybe have uh, some light skirmishing, some arrows back and forth, and maybe you don't even get into a full-fledged battle. You know, maybe, you know, for, a, for an actual battle to happen, either both commanders have to be committed to it, or um, one side has to be left with no option, like no way to withdraw, and then the other side can force them into battle, which that did happen, you know, frequently too, or, you know, sometimes, not, not frequently, <laughs> frequently in the cases of battles, it could happen, but battles themselves were very rare events in medieval warfare, which is another thing we have to, to remember. But um, yeah, again, so the two armies approach each other and there's arrow exchange back and forth. And the point of that, of course, is to soften up your opponent. What you're looking for, what the cavalry is typically going to be looking for, is when there is some disorder or some signs of weakness in the infantry. And the cavalry can move in and hit them hard with a charge and uh, do, do enough damage to, to uh, hopefully bring the, the battle to a conclusion. Now, if we're talking about the Crusades, though, specifically, like Crusader cavalry, what's unique about crusader cavalry that is these latin christian cavalry from the 11th through 13th century period the crusades era anna Comnena, who is a byzantine chronicler who wrote about the first crusade i'm sure a lot of you guys know about her she uh documented the uh the first crusade from the perspective of her father who was the byzantine emperor alexius Comnenus. anna Comnenus says that frankish heavy cavalry could punch through the thickest walls. Now, of course, she doesn't mean that, right? She says that they could shatter uh, city walls. Of course, they couldn't do that. You couldn't charge a group of uh, Frankish cavalry into a wall and, and smash it. But what she's saying there is they were very powerful. Uh, the style of armor that the Franks used at this time, Franks being Western Europeans, uh, the, the chain mail, and uh, the the uh, destrier horses, these war horses, and then the couched lance technique in which they would uh, brace their lance under their arm and then aim it at a target. And you've got a whole line of guys doing that. This is a, this is a very powerful weapon. And um, oftentimes uh, the Franks, Crusader cavalry like this, when they were faced off against uh, their opponents, they could break up pretty dense infantry formations. So like the perfect example of this, of course, is when Crusader armies were faced off against Fatiman armies, especially like we just talked about in some of these videos I did recently, the Battle of Ramla, or the three battles of Ramla that took place uh, early in the history of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. You've got uh, these very large Fatiman armies, I mean, that very much outnumber the Crusader forces. And uh, they've got these huge infantry contingents. Um, and what are the Crusaders able to do? They're able to, this is a, a solid target for them to hit. And the heavy Frankish cavalry can shatter those infantry formations pretty, pretty easily, uh, or, you know, relatively speaking. But um, this is kind of how the Battle of Ascalon worked. Um, and again, this all has to do with the unique fighting style of um, of Crusader cavalry. So you can, I hope this is answering your question to some extent, Ravi. But um, but yeah, the idea there is, and we're gonna we're gonna think about this too. 
Um, think about, have you ever had a horse come running straight at you? <laughs> I mean, for, I don't, probably a lot of people, you know, in modern day, in the modern day Western world have not experienced like a horse coming running straight at them, but maybe, you know, if you've been around horses, you've, you've seen them run. Um, I grew up around horses and I can think of a couple of times where I was in a situation where a horse was running toward me or, you know, near me. And it's, it's, uh, it's an incredible thing. I mean, uh, and, and we're not, ta- we're not talking about a, a, a line of cavalry, but that can be pretty intimidating. So if you are a line of infantrymen, um, you know, there are a lot of situations where for one thing, you're nervous anyway, you know, every, everybody's got some fear going into a battle. So let's say you're a, a, you're a group of infantry, infantrymen, you're, uh, you're, you're lined up there, you know, you've got your, your spears and, and uh, you're, you're waiting to face off against um, this cavalry. And then the Frankish cavalry comes in and they are, uh, you know, th- these, these men of iron, as uh, some of the Muslim chroniclers describe them, these, these heavily armored guys uh, on these, these big war horses, and they have this really tight formation you know, this, this row of cavalry and, uh, they've got these, these, uh, big lances couched and, you know, they're big shields with their intimidating, uh, uh, you know, insignia on them. And they, this thing comes charging at you, comes thundering at you. This isn't one horse or a few horses. This is a whole line of horses. I mean, think about that situation. Uh, there's a lot of people who are maybe just going to take off running in that situation. And that's kind of the game of chicken that can take place sometimes in these, these situations of medieval combat. Um, okay. Well, maybe if we stand here with our weapons and, you know, aim them at this cavalry that's coming at us, uh, maybe we can stab these horses. Maybe, you know, uh, it's, it's a pretty big, maybe, you know, uh, if, I mean, think about what it's like, what, what it would be like. Oh, there's that scene in Braveheart, right? Everybody knows about this scene in Braveheart where I think this is the funny thing about that scene is it, it's almost like when a person today in the modern world is first introduced to the concept of medieval warfare without getting a chance to, to look into it very much. You kind of think to yourself, well, okay, so couldn't we just like get a bunch of long spears and that'll take care of the cat? You know, that's what they show in, in Braveheart is they show, uh, these, these long spears and the horses come charging into them. Uh, and that's, you know, uh, Mel Gibson's secret weapon that he uses in that situation. Um, but you do have to kind of think about what it would actually be like um, to have a whole row of horses come charging at you. Would you really be able to stand there and count on being able to stab the horse? It's a pretty big gamble. And when you got the adrenaline running and you don't, you don't know necessarily what the guys next to you are going to do. I mean, so yeah, um, that's the issue. Uh, but again, there's so many variables here. The quality of the infantry, a really good and solid infantry is, it could probably withstand a lot of cavalries, especially if the cavalry is kind of mediocre. A really good and solid cavalry could probably take out, you know, a mediocre infantry. So, but yeah, I mean, you are onto some good points in that typically um, it would have been suicide in almost any situation to open up a battle with, okay, let's just charge at the infantry with our cavalry. Let's just, you know, the Crusaders could do this sometimes. The Crusaders could break up infantry uh, pretty early on sometimes, especially, you know, they're dealing with uh, these Fatimid armies. This could happen too in, uh, in some of the uh, battles that took place in the Reconquista. But again, you know, not always. I mean, you know, I start talking, I start naming an example or a scenario, and then I think of all sorts of battles where things went a completely different direction. So, but yeah, there was something about the Frankish heavy cavalry that uh, they could oftentimes uh, break up an infantry a lot sooner than other types of, ca- of cavalry would be able to. Now, this, this gets totally different when we're looking at, um, oh, and before I move on to this, and again, that's 
that is something that if if a cavalry can get an infantry to scatter, you know, if you can get an enemy infantry to freak out and people to start panicking and running, you've done your job. Now, oftentimes you want to soften them up with some archery or something like that before you you know, take that risk. Um, but, you know, cavalry can move quickly. So if you're charging and it looks like the infantry is going to hold, then maybe you can just veer off and keep going and come back around. That's the advantage of infantry. You can move faster. Sorry, that's the advantage of cavalry. You can move faster than, um, than guys running around, you know, on foot can do. You can get away more quick. You can get away more quickly, especially. That's the thing that's, that's most, uh, you know, it's, it's, you're more maneuverable um, in terms of, you know, being able to get in and out of a situation quickly. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we're, we're getting at something. Now, one other thing, I want to jump over to the chat in a minute here, but I do want to bring something else up in regards to your question, Ravi, that I think might be helpful. This could be totally different with a different type of cavalry. Now, let's think about one of the types of cavalry that the Crusaders often faced, right? And that is, of course, hold on one second here. Okay, so let's think about one type of cavalry that uh, the Crusaders in the Holy Land, at least not in Spain, but in the Holy Land often faced, and that is the Turkish horse archer. Very formidable warrior. Uh, the Turkish, like the Seljuk Turks in the First Crusade, the, um, the Crusaders arrive in Asia Minor and they're, fi and they're suddenly faced against this enemy like they've never experienced before, the mounted horse archer right now how does this work how do these mounted horse archers work they are very fast so they're different they're quite a bit different than the crusader cavalry the heavy cavalry the heavily armored cavalry they are light they have smaller horses mares typically the Crusaders fought on these big uh, stallion war horses. The Seljuk Turkish horse archers fought on um, these lighter mares that were swifter. They did much armor. Uh, they moved more quickly, but th but they weren't as uh, powerful in terms of weight. Like the ch their charge wasn't anything like what the Crusaders could could muster. But they shot arrows from the saddle. So they were mounted archers. This was this incredible skill th these Turkish horse archers had. They could uh, fire arrows from horseback. And you get a whole bunch of guys doing this. This becomes very uh, uh, a powerful weapon in that it's very disorienting. It can make people panic quickly. You know, you see a bunch of these uh, swift Turkish archers rushing in and spewing arrows everywhere. I mean, it makes people freak out, right? Or it can. Now, now think about that situation. Think about um, uh, how advantageous suddenly um, a, a certain type of infantry formation becomes against that. You know, uh, the what's what's the smartest thing you can do in that situation? Well, it's if it's to have the infantry be very closely formed, very tightly formed, with shields out in like sort of a shield wall type formation, and just to to uh, to hold that defensive position, right? Uh, this is the classic scenario at Dori Lam, at the Battle of Dori Lam. You've got the Turkish horse archers sweeping in and attacking, uh, sh uh, shooting their arrows, you know, to to harass the uh, Frankish column. What does Bowman do? He does something very brilliant. Bowman is the is the leader of the uh, of this particular Crusader army. He has his uh, his knights dismount. And join the infantry, and they create almost a circle, like almost like a, a fortress of men, with their shields and their, you know, closely uh, um, placed together. And this is very good at defending against um, uh, defending against uh, 
the, the mounted horse archer. Now, this wouldn't be as effective against a Crusader cavalry, right? Because you, you have given them a solid target to attack, and they have the weight to prob- you know break that up, possibly, especially if you don't have archers to, to hold the cavalry back. And again, uh, that's another, another side point we should probably bring up. One of the, benefit, uh, one of the things that's beneficial about uh, infantry archers is they can help hold cavalry at bay because they can harass them with arrows. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's a totally different situation uh, when you're up against these horse archers and you can see how that tight infantry formation could uh, kind of, in, in a lot of circumstances, render the horse archer somewhat uh, impotent, right? Because if you've got that tight infantry formation with you know, shields out and uh, everybody is well positioned, then, I mean, they can, and especially if you have your, the ability to launch arrows back at them, if you have some infantry archers too, they can't really get very close to you. And the uh, harassing tactic doesn't really work because you've got a defensive position and you can, you can uh, repel their arrows, or most of them, you know, especially if you're really tightly formed like that, you know, and if it's a large enough group. So anyway, so yeah, does, does that answer your question, Ravi? I hope it does. I'm going to jump over to the chat and see if I did a good job answering that question. I'm going to let you guys be the judge. You guys can tell me if I, if I answered Ravi's question. I'm not, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, but uh, I tried to. Um, all right, here we are in the chat. What's everybody saying? What do you guys think? Is that a... Oh, Jinsul has a really good question. Were the lancers longer than the spears? Now, I'm assuming, Jinsul, you're talking about uh, like cavalry, right? Um, yes, the heavy cavalry, the heavy Frankish cavalry, they used lances were basically long spears, right? They're really long spears that can be effective from horseback, right? You, you're not going to use these really long cavalry lances if you're an infantryman. You know, you're going to be standing there with uh, so- something that's more usable from an infantry position. Yeah, and somebody in the chat just said, lances are by definition longer than spears. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Good job. All right. And uh, King King Louis says, yes, you answered the question well. Okay, well, thank you, King Louis. Hopefully, Ravi agrees. Um, okay, here's another question. Didn't the Turkomans and other horse archers run in small circles firing their bows? Uh, yes, they, they did something like that. They did tactics like that. Um, they, they would ride quickly, and uh, they'd ride in and ride out quickly and, and you know, spew arrows, and it was, you know, it's, it's quite effective. And the thing is, it's, it's most effective about, it's a psychological thing, right? It freaks you out. Everybody's like, "Holy crap!" You know, uh, I think some of some of the um, the Crusader chroniclers describe it almost like you know these spirits rushing in and and you know attacking and rushing out. The thing that you can use to defeat it is keeping your cool. Keep your cool. Keep your formation. And if you've got that solid infantry wall, you can stand there all day. You know, as long as you've got water. And that's what happened at Dory Lamb is. Uh, they, they uh, set themselves up close to a stream and the uh, non-combatants, like the women and the camp followers who were there, because uh, there were a lot of those in the First Crusade, they kept bringing water to the, the guys who were just standing there holding the position. But if you can do that, if you can hold that position, you can tire out the Turkish horse archers because, you know, they, get, they ride in and, and you know, uh, spew their arrows, and uh, eventually they're, you know, as, as tough and fast as their little mares are, they're going to get um, they're going to get tired at some point, right? Okay. Uh, let's see. Bigfoot asks, were lances a one-time affair? Did they break? 
Uh, they could, yeah. Oftentimes they they would break, especially in a, a heavy charge like that, and you would maybe need a uh, um, other another lance, you know. Or if your if your lance broke, uh, you could draw your sword. And there were some techniques uh, for the use of of swords uh, from horseback. Uh, it's 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 le- it was less common, but it was something that that could be done. Uh, this is, let's see, Sir Whimsy Day Pimpington asks, all the non-combatants who accompanied the Crusader army received the same indulgence? Yes, they did, actually. They, uh, the Crusade indulgence was kind of an extension of the Pilgrim's indulgence. So, yeah. Let's get the camera back up here. All right. Anything else, guys, before we call it a night here? And I will say something about our regular podcast we do. Uh, you know, I know we oftentimes, um, usually a lot of times on Wednesday nights, the Real Crusades History crew gets together and we do a, uh, we do a, uh, you know, high dose voltage episode. Not every single Wednesday, but oftentimes on Wednesday. Um, it might not happen this Wednesday. Uh, a lot of my crew is off doing other things this week, but hopefully next week. Let's see. Trying to find. King Louis says, did either the Turks or the Arabs attempt to imitate the Frankish charge? And then Jinsul kind of answered, he said, in the Battle of Azaz in 1125. Yeah, one thing that happened in the Battle of Azaz in 1125, which features in my novel, Why Does the Heathen Rage? Um, The Muslims tried to engage the Crusaders at close quarter combat fairly quickly. And I think it was in part because they were, you know, they there was a lot of uh, experience of them not really being able to break up crusader formations, you know, when they were tightly organized. And so the archery could sometimes seem kind of ineffect, you know, not effective, right? And so they tried in that instance to come up against them close quickly, and it had results for them as a major crusader. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is a good one. Bigfoot asks, how do the horses do with running in the sand? Did it slow them down? So when we think of the Holy Land territory, I think we kind of think sometimes of uh, like a lot of sand everywhere. And there were areas like that. Um, but there was also terrain that was much more solid than that. That was maybe there was you know, some grassy terrain. Um, so it wasn't necessarily like they were always just fighting on uh, always fighting on uh, sand. You know, like that. Um, and in fact, you would want to avoid that kind of terrain for, for a battle. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think we, we have a lot of... Um, uh, it, it, it's not something that comes up in the, in the Chronicles very often, like, um, oh, there was all this sand and so it slowed the... Uh, more often it was, it was uh, mud, actually, if, if, uh, because if a battlefield was... If there was rain, or there had been been some, you know, something to create a muddy area, then that could really slow horses down. So that was something you would want to avoid too. And that's more often something we hear about in the chronicles: is like, oh, well, the muddy terrain was, you know, made things difficult. So, uh, Basil, the second wants to know about the picture on my wall there. Uh, yeah, that's the Battle of Arsuf by Gustave Doré, uh, one of my favorite. Uh, images of his that's king richard the lionheart at uh at arsif in 1191 so all right now weren't the male horses ridden by the normans stronger than the female horses ridden by the muslims yeah yeah the um the uh the stallion destriers of the uh of the western knights yeah they were they were going to be bigger tougher stronger horses than the uh 
the uh, swift uh, mares that the Muslim warriors preferred. But you know, it's a trade-off. Like uh, the the uh, the Turks, they they were looking for speed and these kind of lighter, you know, swift mares. Uh, that's what they preferred. So there you go. Okay, well, I think that's probably good for now. Um, this was going to be just a brief stream. I'll keep you guys posted on when the next uh, high high dose voltage is going to happen. Uh, it is going to happen. But let's say good night to everybody. Um, oh, one last thing. Jinsul says, I hear the stallions were very aggressive and liked to bite. Yes, that was one thing that went into the training of war horses, into uh, the training of these stallions that were used by uh, heavy cavalry. They would they were trained to be aggressive. Uh, they would uh, and they would do things. They were trained to do things like that, like if they were close enough to kick and bite and stuff like that. So pretty, pretty incredible. Okay, all right, guys, you folks have a good night. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for joining me this evening. And oh, before you leave, don't forget to like the stream, um, boost it around a little bit. Okay.